Today's message is titled A Man Named Nicodemus. John chapter 3. John chapter 3, verse 1 to 7 reads There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. Ruler of the Jews meaning he was a member of Sanhedrin and he was the 71 elite elect elders who was, uh, we could say, a PhD holder in the law. He knew the law inside out. Uh, he was a Pharisee of Pharisees, like Paul used to say, I'm the Pharisee of Pharisees. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God. For no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Most assuredly I say to you, Unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. Okay. So you, most of us have read this chapter, and this is a very common uh, uh, thought chapter. Some people have uh, a shallow understanding of this chapter because this is introduced to you at the time of uh, you praying the sinner's prayer and they say now look this is what is given in the bible sometimes uh, people not in all churches in some churches do not go much into it in a deeper way and so there is a misunderstanding especially in uh, on on the fact of john chapter 3 verse 5 uh, uh, when Jesus says, uh, Verily I say unto you, unless you are born of water and spirit, you shall not enter the kingdom of God. People teach it as uh, water baptism and Holy Spirit baptism, but it is much more than that what Jesus is trying to uh, reveal in it. Now, when you look at this whole scenario, there was a man named Nicodemus. Now, who was Nicodemus? Nicodemus was actually, the Bible scholars say, one of the richest, or you would say the richest man in Jerusalem. See, the people who were the members of Sanhedrin, which is a council of uh, people who have learned up to the uh, mastered, mastered the law, book of law, and almost uh, taken a PhD, they are appointed like magistrates, I would say. All right, so they are the rulers of Jew, and there were 71 elders in the member of Sanhedrin, and one of the members of Sanhedrin was Nicodemus. He was an extremely rich man, had a lot of real estate. Now, all this information is just from these. Uh, encyclopedias or history books are based on that I'm just giving you so just to tell you that Nicodemus was a great guy he was up there and his very name means superior he was uh, superior over others he had influence and in fact Nicodemus is the one who saved Jesus when he was brought to the Sanhedrin for they accused him of blasphemy against God and so on and then when Jesus was crucified who came to claim his body or give the spices to embalm the body it was Nicodemus now this man is now coming to Jesus. Look at this whole story. He comes to Jesus and what does he say? He tells to Jesus, Rabbi, we know that you have come from God because of the miracles, signs and wonders that you do. It's only when you do the, if you, if you can do these things, it's only because of the God's presence in you or you're anointed with that. Now, for example, if I tell Pastor Royenson that, uh, Pastor Royenson, you're so anointed with the gift of prophecy or gift of healing, um, uh, that uh, and I know that it's the very presence of God. You, what do you expect him to tell me? You, you expect him to say, "Well, it is the uh, the very presence of God in me that makes me do these things and so on," right? But what did Jesus respond? Doesn't he give a strange answer? He doesn't say that. Yes, Nicodemus, I am the Son of God, and I have been sent to be a sacrificial atonement. He doesn't say that. He, in fact, he says, "Verily, I say, it's a very strange answer." Unless and until you are born again, you shall not see the kingdom of God. What does that answer imply? First of all, Nicodemus gets confused. Secondly, he says, basically he's trying to tell Nicodemus, Nicodemus, you are blind. You are spiritually blind. That's what he's trying to say. See, a spiritually blind person sees Jesus not as the Christ or the Savior or the Messiah, but he sees Jesus as a miracle worker. When you are not into the faith, what God does is, the Bible says in the book of John that God the Father draws his children or elect to the Son purely by his grace, 
right why did jesus perform all miracles and signs and wonders is to draw people to come to the belief that he is the son of god now in the book of john the very last chapter it says all these he performed so many miracles signs and wonders that the all the books in the world is not enough to record it so he has recorded seven miracles in the book of john so that you and i will know that he is the son of god that's how john john ends the chapter when he says because all those seven signs that he has recorded from right from changing of water to wine or resurrection of lazarus has seven characteristics of him being the son of god uh, that itself is a series okay so seven signs meaning miracle with a purpose directed towards the fact that jesus is the son of god now when a spiritually blind person sees jesus he has to see him as a messiah and worship him as being the son of god he only sees the miracles this is because he is spiritually blind so then he says verily i say unto you unless and until you become a born again you shall not see the kingdom of god nicodemus gets confused and he says well how can a man who is old go back to the mother's womb and step out again so he doesn't understand the whole concept now he tries to explain it further by saying unless you are born of water and he puts two components there water and spirit you shall not enter the kingdom of god do not marvel that i told you that you must be a born again all right now let's see the whole picture in three different components one is the deficiency of a natural birth now there are three miracles that takes place three miracle births that takes place one is a natural birth and the one is the second is a virgin birth and the third is the rebirth or being born again in spirit okay now natural birth can you can you actually control it see i know that couples try to have a child but you cannot uh, you cannot calculate it it all comes from god see what people think is man and woman manufacture babies no man and woman cannot manufacture babies it is just a transfer of life from above and god uses a man and a woman to transfer that life and uses a woman's womb okay uh, can you control your own birth no you cannot control your own birth even your timing of your birth is uh, calculated by god only in cases like i know the hindus uh, uh, who believe in a time of birth and if it's a cesarean they 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 request the doctor to do the uh, cesarean at this time at this day but uh, time is time of birth is purely in god's hands it's not in your hands all right second is the virgin birth and then we'll go into the final thing of a rebirth to understand this to have a deeper understanding so first i'm going to say is the deficiency of natural birth we should all remember that uh, nicodemus was born into the natural world he was bound into the sinful world and he had uh, he was born with a sinful nature now uh, do i have a bible to back that uh, verse to back that yes psalms 51:5 says behold i was brought forth in iniquity and in sin my mother conceived me it's not that uh, my mother was sinning when conceiving uh, when i was conceived it's trying to say that we are all born with a sinful nature now i just want to specify this thing is that when your son or daughter uh you know after your after your child is born you cannot uh, bring up your child in a uh, we all try to do that uh, bring up your child in such an environment that uh, uh, they will never know sin you cannot do that we are born with a sinful nature this is the reason why when you uh, when you get called from from the school that your son or daughter has stolen or your son has beaten up this child you you are in a denial stage no it's not possible my son or daughter won't do that It, it is possible because you're born by sinful nature we are not teaching uh, we are not send our children to a, we don't send our children to a special school to teach them how to sin right they 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 have that nature in them so we we will always be in denial oh when our child does something wrong the uh, husband will accuse the wife she has he, he has got your character or the wife accuses the husband this is your character that the child is showing you are the one who gets angry so fast now the daughter is learning these things from you no it's a sinful nature that you know, you, you hear that it's the same story in every house it's not just my house every house the husband is accusing the wife when the child does something wrong and the wife is accusing the husband no 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 this is your character this is how you behave so the child has learned it from you right so this is what you have to know is when we are born we are the sons of adam so we are born in sin and we have a general tendency of a sinful nature what about jesus 
he's not a son of adam he's a son of god okay so does it make him superior no it doesn't make him superior so he had to be born son of god by virgin birth which is a uh, virgin conception for him to be a sinless savior to go through an atonement sacrifice for us to be redeemed and delivered and receive the free gift of salvation purely by the grace of god now uh, you would say well jesus had this superior uh, nature in him no jesus was tempted at every point just like we were tempted he was hungry yes and he went through all the temptations that we go through and this is why he is the candidate who is eligible to die on that cross because he knows how it is to to go through temptations and issues or grievances and so on uh, so he cannot have a foster father he had a foster father he cannot have a father who is a son of adam because his father is in heaven so that is why he had to come step into this flesh suit through a virgin womb and be born okay so first thing you have to know is that nicodemus was born into the natural world was bound to the sinful world and therefore he had a sinful nature so what was important was he was therefore blind to the spiritual world i just want to also one more verse for you to know um see ephesians 2 3 says among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind and were by nature children of wrath just as the others okay so we are all bound to the sinful world that is the deficiency of a natural birth so you are born spiritually dead you are not born spiritually alive so there is a need for a sinless savior to come so i just talked about that a sinless savior had to be born by virgin birth all right now uh when i say uh, nicodemus was blind to the spiritual world john 3 3 makes it very clear uh it says about that uh, i also want you to see another thing that um, he says is a uh, book of ephesians 4 18 talks about this about being spiritually blind ephesians 4 18 paul specifies and says having their understanding darkened being alienated from the life of god because of the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart we are all spiritually blind and we need to go through that new birth experience because now for example the word of god is uh, in, in john 1 1 it says in the beginning was the word the word was with god and the word is god that word word is referring to logos which is a mind of god right so now uh, rema is the revelation of god okay it's the revelatory a uh, revelation meaning, meaning it is the decoded mind of god basically what does that mean for example a psychiatrist is trained to read the mind of his patient right so when the patient gives the complaints or symptoms what the patient is going through he has been trained to read the mind of what the patient similarly if you ask a non believer to read the bible can he understand anything no he cannot understand anything because the translator or the interpreter uh, is uh, is is the holy spirit and without the holy spirit you are not able to read the mind of god right so now when uh, wh- what i'm trying to say here is uh, how was nicodemus blind you, you remember jesus in the very same chapter tells him that uh, aren't you the teacher in israel why does he say that see i aren't you the teacher of israel because this born again is not being introduced in john chapter 3 verse 3 it is introduced it was in ezekiel chapter 37 it talks about being born of the spirit don't go to ezekiel 37 as yet i will explain to you how it becomes ezekiel 37 talks about being born in the spirit and jesus promises through the prophet ezekiel about uh, this experience of being born of water and spirit which i'll uh, quickly say what it is and so what is uh, uh, jesus trying to tell nicodemus aren't you the teacher of israel uh, isn't it given in ezekiel 37 about this concept of being born again uh, it's uh, talked about the concept of being born in the spirit so uh, what is he trying to say is you know uh, nicodemus you need to be born again so that you are spiritually alive and you understand the things of heaven and you see me not just as a miracle worker but beyond the miracle worker a savior the messiah 
to die and later on he he uh, reveals to him that all right right so now we are looking at the efficiency of uh, the virgin birth all right so i want you to look at um, uh, john chapter 3 verses 14 to 17 this is the place where he gives him the the christmas message i would say that i am god in flesh so he tells nicodemus this john 3 14 17 he says and as moses lift up the serpent in the wilderness even so i'm talking john 3 14 17 even so must the son of man be lifted up for whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life for and you know this uh, verse uh, it is the gospel verse for god so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. What I want you guys to look at is the son of man. See, in, in the book of John, sometimes Jesus refers to him as son of man. Sometimes Jesus refers to him as son of God. What is the difference between, is it the same? Whenever Jesus mentions son of man, remember it is he's talking, he's trying to say that it is God in flesh. Son of God is the divine nature of God. Okay. He is the God, a, a part of God in uh, who was who was a partaker in at the time of creation so you you should remember the difference between son of man and son of god and john is the one that you will see in some of the chapters it quickly changes from son of man to son of god and so on so here jesus is trying to tell nicodemus hold on nicodemus i am god in flesh and i am i have come to the world to die a, a sinless savior for an atonement sacrifice for yours and our, all all the sins of the world he doesn't go into that detail but he illustrates the moses lifting up the serpent which is a sign or a shadow of what is to happen of jesus to be crucified on the cross unfortunately the jews uh, was expecting their uh, uh, was not expecting a suffering messiah they were expecting a prosperous messiah to come and set free the israelites from the roman rule and establish the kingdom of heaven on earth that is what the jews were expecting and uh, uh, and they couldn't still see it and they were continuing to be spiritually blind so this is explained to nicodemus and uh, so the very uh, very necessity of the very very necessity of a virgin birth for jesus which is the second miracle birth that takes place to for a sinless savior because without a virgin birth is not there is no sinless savior without sinless savior there is no atonement sacrifice and without atonement sacrifice there is no redemption or salvation so that's why jesus come uh, comes to the uh, comes to the earth as a virgin birth and thank god for christmas day okay amen okay so now uh, not only jesus is a ministry of revelation uh, it's also a ministry of redemption we see that uh, in john 3 19 20 he says this he says this is the condemnation that light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil for everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come into the light lest his deeds should be exposed what is happening is there are so many spiritually blind people here uh, uh, not not just here i'm not just saying this church anywhere they don't like the light they don't want to come to the light because their deeds will be exposed and they think that they have to do all the hard work to maintain holiness and holiness is something that is a gift uh, that is given by god it's one of the character that you, uh, you 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 get when you become a born again that you want to be holy and the holy spirit is working in you to make sure that you do not step into uh, any unrighteous acts now the fact that the fact that uh, you are going to sin even after being a born again right because we have the sinful nature there are three components which which is there to pu push you into sin what is the first component is the satan uh, as the second component is the world and the third component is your flesh right so now uh, what, what what you should understand is um, so what what do i do is when jesus washed the feet of feet of his disciples and taught them the last message before he went to the cross what was he trying to teach them was he introducing a ritual into the you know he was not uh, he was not introducing a ritual uh, practice see in the bible throughout from old testament to new testament water is symbolized by the word of god 
so he was trying to tell the disciples look when you are in this world what what gets dirty your feet gets dirty right when you're walking in this world so what is that feet getting dirty with dust illustrate it illustrates the unrighteous thoughts and acts because you're influenced by the world that's why paul says do not conform to the ways of the world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind for that which is good and acceptable and perfect will of god so what he's trying to say is you need to wash your feet how do you wash your feet with the word of god when you meditate in the word of god your thoughts will be you will not conform to the ways of the world but your thoughts will be transformed into the ways of god and not only should you wash your feet what am i doing now washing your feet in the spiritual sense so you are washing your feet from those unrighteous thoughts and acts right that's what he was trying to illustrate but when he went to peter what did peter say wash me whole what did peter, jesus say you are already clean peter all you have to do is just wash the feet what was he trying to say well jesus didn't die by that time he was just about to because peter had confessed that you are the christ when you believe that is it you're clean right so this is this is the whole thing of the washing of the feet what i'm trying to say is when jesus said verily i say unto you unless you are born of water and spirit you shall not enter the kingdom of god there are two components and he compares it to a birth isn't it now when a man and a woman donate or yeah uh, rather uh, contribute their genetic material for conception to take place similarly in the spiritual birth there are two components one is uh, the word of god and the other one is the spirit now when the word of god and the spirit come together there is a conception a new birth that takes place i'll explain to you further on that uh, i don't uh, i have numerous verses to prove you that uh, water is uh, symbolizing the word of god and i'm just going to tell you about, about it from ezekiel 37 now so when the word of god which is the mind of god and the spirit comes together the revelation from the word of god hits your heart you get convicted you know that you're sin uh, you are a sinner and you need a savior to redeem you and to save you and then you come into a new birth experience which is not an emotional experience it's much more than that i will explain to you uh, people think it is in stages that takes place like metamorphosis they think it's like a tadpole becoming a frog it is not a tadpole becoming a frog it is a frog which becomes a prince by the kiss of grace it's purely by the grace of god right and what is being born of the spirit then jesus says it's a wind that blows as it wills you do not know it's in, uh, given in verse 8 you do not know where it is coming from you do not know where it is taking you to so is a person who is born of the spirit now when he says being born of water and spirit he's talking about uh, he's actually illustrating it from or re revealing it from ezekiel chapter 37 and so it's important let's read ezekiel chapter 37 to make things clear and you know that uh, the Holy Spirit is referred to as a wind from Acts chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, there was a sound of a mighty rushing wind and they were all filled up with the Holy Ghost and they spoke in tongues as the utterance. Okay, So you have these two concepts. Holy Spirit is coming like a mighty rushing wind. Water is the word of God that cleanses you. So when both of them combine, what do I give? What, do I have a part in it? Well, you just need to give your womb of faith okay let's read ezekiel 37 and i want you to look at verse 4 what he uh, what the lord says uh, tells uh, tells uh, is prophet ezekiel is again he said to me prophesy to these bones now basically ezekiel is taken to a valley of dry dead bones he says prophesy to these bones and say to them oh dry bones hear the word of the lord okay born of water all right Thus says the Lord God to these bones, surely I will cause breath, breath to enter you. The wind is coming and you shall live. I will put tendons on, on you and bring flesh upon you and cover you with skin, put breath in you and you shall live. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. Uh, then he says in verse 7, so I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I prophesied, there was a noise, suddenly a rattling. You remember Acts chapter 2, what happened? There was a sound like that of a mighty rushing wind. Rattling and the bones came together, bone to bone. Indeed, as I looked, the tendons of the flesh came upon them and skin covered them and there was no breath in them. Still, there is no breath in them because the spirit hasn't come. Only the word has come. 
now he says and he said to me prophesy to the breath prophesy son of man there is coming son of man and say to the breath thus says the lord god come from the four winds o breath and breath on these slain that they may live so i prophesied and as he commanded me and breath came into them and they lived and stood upon their feet so what does this refer to this is why jesus tells nicodemus aren't you the teacher didn't you teach them ezekiel 37 you can't understand what i'm trying to tell you so he's introducing the new covenant and he's trying to say look the word of god which is prophesied to the bones they still do not live it's just like a believer a non believer reading the word of god absolutely no idea so then he says prophesy to the to the son of man to um to the spirit to come what's happening is if i am going to preach here i have to receive revelation the word of and i have to pass it on to you if i'm passing it on to you it's very essential that i pray that jesus opens your eyes and the spirit comes upon you and that you will be able to understand what is going on otherwise you people will all go to sleep okay because your brain cannot take it so the brain brain is also given the strength to to uh, uh, go through and uh, listen to it and okay so this is the concept of uh, 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 the, what jesus was talking about when he said being born of water and spirit without that you're not going to enter the kingdom of god so you need to be a live person not just a skeletal structure uh receiving the word and absolutely having no idea what's going on you need to also have the be born of a spirit for you to interpret the mind of god and become a psychiatrist so that you will be able to read the mind of god so when you read the bible then it becomes more clear that that is why people say to pray before you read or i wouldn't say even read you have to study the bible uh reading the bible is not going to take you anywhere you need to do also your part all right uh you need to have faith in god and do your own research you need to sometimes uh, not just look at one teaching and not just believe blindly whatever i say you need to go back and confirm and make sure what i'm telling is true or not so we were talking about uh, the the efficiency of virgin birth and uh, jesus had come for uh for the atonement sacrifice the verse that says uh, talks about uh, shedding of blood is hebrews 9:22 i'm just quickly going to that it says and according to the law almost all things are purified with blood and without shedding of blood there is no remission you have to shed blood now adam is the one uh who uh, we, we always like to put it uh, put the blame on ad but if it was anyone in his place also would have done the same thing in first corinthians 15:22 it says for as in adam all die even so christ be uh, christ all shall be made alive meaning that one man uh, lost the authority to the devil and so the, another man has to come and that's why jesus is referred to as the second adam and shed blood to regain back that authority and only if you believe in jesus will you also receive the same authority because that is the power of the kingdom of god all right now you know you need to know the a little bit of difference between kingdom of god and kingdom of heaven is it the same or is it different all right kingdom of heaven is referring to a physical kingdom kingdom of god is referring to a spiritual kingdom kingdom of heaven was the physical kingdom was jesus had come to set up actually for the jews but the jews rejected christ and so then jesus appoints paul to be a vessel to the gentiles and the gospel went to the gentiles and then from there it became the kingdom of god that is a spiritual kingdom was preached to the gentiles and the rest of the uh, non jews we can call them uh, so that uh, the spiritual kingdom shall enter and you will have a new birth experience and be a part of god's family all right everybody is so quiet maybe I should <laughs> this it's it sounds not like a pentecostal church anyway now what is uh, uh, being saved uh, i talked about conception uh, i also want to talk about peter talking about the same thing which i talked about the word of god and the spirit he says in first peter 123 he says having been born again not of what corruptible seed but incorruptible through the word of god which lives and abides forever if that word of god has to live in you it also has to join with the spirit of god and you provide with the womb of faith believe what is the uh, what is faith actually it is a hard trust in god what is believing meaning hard trust in god whether you are progressing in life whether you are in a disaster whether you are in a storm whether you are prosper whatever is your situation right now you will still trust god that god is intending to, 
and has a purpose and a plan and you walk not by sight but by faith okay so that's what's talking about that now whenever you become a born again a character is produced you know some people come and say doctor i'm sca i'm scared that i lose my salvation your salvation is secure so does it mean that after you're saved you can sin and uh, you know and still go to heaven there's a concept of people preaching about once saved or uh, always saved now remember one thing you are going to be in all sorts of trouble because when you sin after becoming a believer and you're not repenting about it god disciplines you there's a difference between a believer being disciplined and a non-believer uh, still re uh, receiving the wrath or under the wrath. He disciplines you. He chastens you. Just like a father will discipline a child. God does discipline you. And uh, uh, he tries to warn you many a times. Many a times. And if you are not uh, going to heed to his voice, he disciplines you. He does that for your own good. You might go through a little bit of embarrassment. But he does that through your own good. But never say that God is punishing me. I've heard many people say that. The punishment was taken upon on the cross. God is disciplining me is a better term to use. Okay. So when we become a born again, we, receive, we have the character of God in us. Right. So it says in 2 Peter 1.4, which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust now when you're born you have the genetic components of your dad and mom so similarly when you're spiritually born you'd have the characteristics you better have the characteristics of christ in you when you have the characteristics of christ in you you will uh, you, you, you have become a new person and it's not that you are born and then you have to fix your eyes and nose and so on you're born full there is a finality to it there's a finality to it but you are still a baby in Christ and you have to learn to walk so when you have to learn to walk because you know uh, in Peter talks about newborn babies desiring the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby uh, uh, what happens to you is you need you need to learn to walk and talk with God and that is why it is important to be baptized in this into the spirit of the body of Christ and that is you have to get connected to a church where the church members shall nurture you and teach you how to walk and talk with God and uh, place you in, in the body of Christ to receive a blessing and not only are you going to receive a blessing you by sitting in this church are being a blessing for others God will gradually take you from just receiving a blessing uh, but by actively participating and being a blessing in the body of Christ so that you have the because you are now a partaker of his divine nature and then the other thing is that uh, you get a family when you are uh, in the uh, uh, in the in the you get adopted into the family of God all right so just like uh, Psalms 103 says as a father pities his children so the Lord pities those who fear him and um, what is the traits of being a born again yeah, how much time did I take um, what, what is the traits of being a born again so how do you know that this person is a born again? Very difficult because why? Why is it difficult to know that whether you are a born again believer or not? Because uh, we are all great actors. I can act very holy in front of you. When I come to church, I can talk very decently to you. I can inquire about your family, how they are doing, when I really don't mean it. Right? Or I might uh, try to help you because I know that if I help you, I'll get a help back. Or I expect somebody to help me back. And if I know that you are working for some organization which can influence my business, I act friendly to you. All right. How do you know that a person is born again? If you are a born again, there are certain traits that you have. You will love Jesus and his word, not just believe in him. Why will you love uh, Jesus and his word? Because it says, uh, Matthew 3.17 says, Suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. God the Father loves his son. And when his traits are in you, you will also love his son. You will love his word, the, the word of God, not just believe in it. Uh, you, will, you will take it as your spiritual food and you will be more and more interested to know more about how God is and what his character is. And that is what is about personally knowing God. When people say you need to ha have him as your personal savior, what does it mean? It means that I want to know his word. I want to be able to read his mind. So you have interest in the word of God. All of a sudden you were busy uh, fulfilling the lusts of your flesh and in the world and now you are so interested to know more about him this is because you have received his character so that is the first thing that uh, you have I'll be finishing soon don't worry I'm done almost the second thing is that you will have 
inner witness of the spirit romans 8 16 says spirit himself bear witness with what with our spirit that we are children of god so now you the, the, the there is an inner spirit that is living in you now that is that spirit is what uh, god promises in ezekiel i shall put a spirit in you and he shall be a, the new witness so that uh, spirit holy spirit will be an inner witness in you who will be guiding you and he will be your comforter and he will be giving you assurance do not worry this is a plan of god god is working it up and he shall be the prayer partner with you because the book of romans also says that he intercedes with us for us and in us all right so he, uh, when you are praying the holy spirit is also praying with you and there are certain things that you do uh, which which is needed in your prayer which he prays for you for that because with our intellect we are not able to know and there are some sins that you commit that you do not know that it is a sin it's the holy spirit that reveals it to, to god the father remember this in the old testament there was a sacrifice of a particular animal they used to do for the sins that uh, what is it it's called a forgotten sin basically a sin that you did not know that you committed uh, they used to sacrifice an animal so now in the new covenant what happens is the holy spirit is the one which reveals it to god the father that you know he has it. he has it. Confess the sin because he doesn't believe that it's a sin. Let me give you an example. That even if it is a small sin that you know we we very sensitive different levels, we think that oh that's so that's okay if I lied about it, it's only for the good. Uh, but the Holy Spirit knows that it's a sin, so you don't in your mind uh, expect to ask God for forgiveness. And so, hello, uh, ask for forgiveness. So what happens? The Holy Spirit intercedes for you, and then you may have you will have a desire for forgiveness. Each time you sin after being a believer, you will always feel uh, uh, you will always feel bad about it, uh, and uh, you will want to come back. Because this is because of the Holy Spirit. You will you will have always want to come back to uh, being holy and uh, doing the righteous works in Christ and for Christ. And the final is you will have a desire to share Jesus with others. You, you, you will not just be a. Uh, of course, everybody cannot be a teacher. But you can be a reacher for Christ.